You can hear us all okay? Uh, I, I think so. Good, okay, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Representative Long is here to present the bill. Um, and we're relating to the education of children of parents who are homeless. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, you're on the floor. Thank you. Uh, Mark Malone, uh, representative from South Burlington. I'm here to do a brief introduction of H-638, uh, which on its face is a fairly straightforward bill, but that I just doomed it. Uh, because, of course, once you guys get into it, I'm sure there'll be all sorts of issues that you'll have to deal with. But in any event, uh, Patrick Burke, the principal from South Burlington, who's on, on the phone uh, to join us, uh, he and I were discussing this uh, probably last uh, fall uh, when, he, when he raised this as an issue that uh, a, a child who is at school uh, who has been homeless uh, that individual can really go to, to any school, uh, but in such a situation, uh, an uh, that child could be at at a particular high school, it's established some routine, some uh, semblance of, of normalcy uh, in, in his or her life, uh, and then uh, happily, the parents uh, or guardians could uh, find a permanent residence in, in a different uh, location, a different district, and under the current law, that uh, that student would have to transfer to that other high school. Uh, which uh, the problem is that you know a, a, a child like this has has dealt with a lot of adversity, uh, and it may be better for that individual to be able to complete high school uh, in that school where uh, where he or she has started. Uh, I mean that's the crux of the bill is to be able to allow that to happen uh, if the student has. Uh, gone through a uh, sophomore year, so has established those relationships in high school, uh, that that student should have the opportunity uh, to finish uh, high school uh, at that particular school. So that, that's the crux of it, and I'm happy to take some initial questions, and we'll probably defer all the hard questions to Patrick. And I, I neglected to say that uh, Patrick Burke is on the phone with us this morning. Um, any questions? Um, I'm just trying to pull up the bill, but Martin, I know we have talked about this before. Um, there is provision in the bill for the, for the parents to be involved in that decision, right? I'm sorry, yes. I'm just looking for that language. It's uh, towards the end. It's on, I believe, around line 17 and 19 on page 3. Unless the child's parents. Yes. Okay. Right. So, so, so there's, so there's a sort of a buy-in process. Th there is, yes. That's correct. Okay. Um, the only other question I had, I don't know if this is more for Jim, um, but uh, did receive an email from um, Amanda Garces of the Human Vermont Human Rights Commission who had requested that we consider um, changing the word parent for caregiver or guardian um, to address the interests of kids who are being raised by grandparents, aunts, uncles, and friends. Yeah, I think something along those lines yeah, makes, makes sense. Yeah, we certainly want to have whoever is in charge of that child's uh, upbringing to be involved in that decision. So I think that that's, that would be a fine change. Uh, you described this as it would allow this to happen. Um, and I'm sorry, I haven't read through it in great detail. But uh, essentially it would, it would take the decision out of this. Right now a school has sort of the leeway Right. To, you know, allow it to happen anyway. No, not really. Not really. Right. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. But. Yeah. So, so uh, I can uh, leave that for Patrick. But very, very quickly, I understand that a school can have transfer students, uh, but the that student is not counted as one of the students in that school. Right. And, and in this instance, it would be. So the so the money would follow or stay with that student. So, so. It's boiled down to residents. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. So. All right. And it would. And it would. Um, uh, require then a school to allow this to happen. Yes. Okay. Yes. That, that that that's correct. So if there are no other questions, I'll run off to my other meeting. Uh, <laughs> I, I would. I can share just like a scenario of what this looks like in practice, and then. So, then so Patrick, you probably should. Uh, you should probably uh, say your name for your. 
sorry, I didn't mean to take no, your. No, uh, no, your no that's okay. There. Patrick, uh, can you introduce yourself to the committee, please? Sure, I'm Patrick right. Burke. I'm principal at South Burlington High School. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Sure thing. So, I mean, you know, um, without going into too much detail about the actual language of the uh, proposed legislation, the reality for us is that what happens is we'll have some students who will. Uh, one way or another kind of lose their permanent housing and they'll um, end up classified as homeless and because there's a federal law of a candy vento which you may be familiar with which allows for homeless students to maintain the educational residence in the district that they were originally enrolled in um, when they became um, homeless so so we do have already, we'll have students who, who are uh, residents of the city of South Burlington, they become homeless, then let's say that they end up in a shelter in Burlington or in, or in a hotel in Colchester. They can continue to enroll in South Burlington because of McKinney Vento, which is a federal legislation or regulation. Um, but then what, what can happen is they can then find a permanent residence, and let's say they find a permanent residence in Winooski or in Burlington or Colchester, and then uh, we're in the situation where it's like, okay, now you've lost your educational residency that you had because you lived in South Burlington, and you've lost your McKinney Vento status, and so now you need to transfer to Winooski or Burlington or whatever, and, and you know, my perspective is that, like, we, you know, it's obviously, you know, it's hard enough for um, for these young people. And and I also understand that, like, you know, maybe if it's somebody who's in sixth grade or seventh grade, it would, you know, it would be fine for them and, and probably beneficial for them to, to enroll in school in, in the town in which they're residing. But when it comes to someone who's, who's you know, really playing out the end of their educational career and has established relationships at a high school, probably with social workers and guidance counselors, you know, let's let that kid um, uh, finish and, and not create another bump in the road for them. Uh, and, the, and the way that we can allow for that to happen is for them to be able to maintain their educational residency um, in, the, in the community that they had established it when they became home. So that's it. I mean, it's really, and you know, it's 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 unfortunately something that happens more than you would think, and um, particularly in in um, in South Burlington, where it, the housing market is very tight. We have a lot of, uh, not a lot. I mean, I don't want to overstate it, but you know, they are memorable situations where you really feel like, um, you know, you want to be able to um, support the student and um, help them finish what they started in your system. And that's it. You know, it's really that simple, and I explained that to Martin, and, and uh, I don't like being in conversations with families where I have to say, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I, we would love to have your child stay here, but they need to transfer to wherever. Uh, Patrick, be. Representative Kubli, do you, do you find that this is a... Uh, growing problem in our schools. Have you spoke with other principals throughout the state? Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Uh, no. I, I mean, I, no, I haven't spoken with other principals. I would suspect that the, that this issue is is one that as the um, your more populated areas in the state, it's more, it's more uh, significant. And so um, you know, I would, I would suspect, perfect, They're, now we're doing morning announcements here at the high school, so. <laughs> um, I suspect that, um, and you know, a lot of times in, in, in Chittenden County, like even where the lines are drawn, you know, uh, is, is difficult for people. So I've got folks who are like, look, I'm going to stay homeless until I find a place in South Burlington. They think they find a place in South Burlington only to learn that, oh, it's actually not in South Burlington, it's in the south end of Burlington or, you know, and something like that. So I think it is more common in 
in Chittenden County, probably also in your more densely populated areas that have multiple school districts that make up like a, a metropolitan area. So, um, you know, uh, it might happen down in, in other parts of the state, but I, I think it's something that happens up here. You know, it's hard to move out of the Newport, um, the North Country Union School District. You know, it's, it's like, I think it's like a hundred if you know, so I would suspect that they experience this a little bit less than we do. But, um, and again, I don't want to overstate the, the number of times this happens, but it, it does, it's not infrequent, and it is a situation where I really feel like we can just fix it and, and help out uh, kids and families who are already in a tough spot. Peter, did you have a question? Yeah, and this may be a better question for our legislative council, but I'm just wondering if this is a system that could be gamed in some way. In other words, you live in South Burlington, you, you've got a kid who's completing 10th grade, you sell your house, you live with grandma and grandpa for a couple of weeks to you know, render, render you homeless, and then you move to uh, Winooski, and, and then you can sort of claim this, even though what you've really done is just sort of moved, found a, found a loophole to keep your kid at, at the high school that you were just in. Um, and I'm just, I, I, I don't know, are there legal definitions of what is homeless? Uh, and so I'm just curious if this system can be gamed in any way. Is that for me or is that for legal counsel? I don't know who the best person is. I guess if you have a response, that would I, be I have a response. Great. I mean, to be honest, um, I, don't, I don't see how that, even that situation, I don't see how that games the system because this, the, because it, it, all, all that's allowing to happen is for, is for South Burlington to continue, or for that family to continue their educational residency for their 10th grade or beyond student for the final three years of that child's educational experience. So even in that case, like, Winooski's not losing a student. Um, the money's going to South Burlington already anyway. And so, I mean, that's kind of the the next layer to this issue are, are other families, you know, mom dies or dad takes off and they lose their house and they're now housing insecure, but they they aren't homeless and they and they have that exact situation that you just described. We're telling those kids they have to transfer also, which is which is, if you ask me, nonsensical, but um, at least this bill takes care of uh, students. And I, I, I don't know, I read the I read the proposed bill and it looked like there's some language in there that talks about what it means to be homeless. I know McKenny Vindo has um, yeah. has definitions of what it means to be to be homeless, but but uh, I have I don't have any concerns about anybody. The educational residency in itself is is a is an interesting dynamic uh, because uh, I'm sorry, especially at the high school level. Because um, there's, you know, there's no, there's no. If a student moves, the, the, it's almost like if, when when my students move to Winooski and want to stay enrolled here, well, Winooski's not losing a student if the student stays enrolled here. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't really. Um, I mean, if you ask me, that should be okay too. You know, and regardless of the of the reason, but for now, I think it would be nice to take care of the kids and families that are clearly in crisis, much less um, it, as opposed to other students who just are experiencing disruption. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I got one. Caleb. Yeah. Caleb. Go ahead. Representative Elder here. Um, just curious. How many students do you think this might apply to roughly over like a, you know, it could be over a five year period even? I mean, are we, are, and I know these dynamics are changing in schools, but over the past five years, is this kind of a problem that exists in single digit numbers or in dozens? I mean, can you just kind of give me a sense for the scale? Yeah, I was going to say 10, but. Okay. You know, so, yeah, I would say five to 10. Five to 10 students. Over that, over the past maybe five years or something, or would you say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think we have one or two a year that probably fit into this category, and, and as you're saying, that dynamic changes. And your school district, how, how many how many students 
or equalize pupils or whatever measure? Oh, that, I mean, I have 940 students at my high school like bodies. I don't know what that translates to. Right, right, okay, but at the, at the high school. Is, yeah. Right, that's fine. All right. Well, Patrick, uh, Representative Kupla here. I, I serve on the uh, Child Poverty and, um, and uh, Strengthening Families Advisory Board, and I think the information that I receive is that this is a problem that's growing um, uh, due to poverty in our state, and homelessness is growing as well. So I would suspect that we're going to find um, more and more of these issues popping up with our schools. Um, and I certainly thank you for your testimony. Um, and if there are no more questions, oh. Sorry, I, I do have one Kathleen? question. The, yeah, this is Representative James from Manchester. Um, one of the first things I asked um, uh, Martin about was this clause at the very end about um, basically getting parental and district buy-in so that you know, I, I was envisioning, I guess, a, a situation that I, I didn't think would be ideal where maybe a, a child was, a student was being allowed to stay in that district against, you know, over the wishes of his family or over the wishes of the receiving district. And I just wonder, you know, if you've seen that scenario or how you would see that that playing out. Um, you know, I was, I guess I was very happy to see that the parents had a voice here and wonder if you could reflect on that just a little bit. I think it's, um, I haven't seen the situation where the, uh, where the students and family did not want to stay in the district that where the child would reside. I think what would be, what would make sense to your point would be that if they wanted to, if they want to have their educational residency shifted to where they now have a permanent residence, of course they have the right to do that. Um, I'm not um, certain that it necessarily would benefit or would have the impact of the intended legislation if you give the if you give my school the option to say no. I, I think that when the student has established educational residency as public schools, it's our responsibility to educate them regardless of their situation. And so, this legislation should give that student and family all the rights that a resident of South Burlington would have in terms of um, uh, accessing uh, a free appropriate public education in South Burlington. Um, and I say that because, you know, honestly, there are times when, um, you know, uh, obviously students and families who are in crisis and, and are experiencing insecurity relative to housing, like they, there's, there's often affiliated difficulties that can make my life harder, you know, can make a school's life harder, but that's our job. And we should, you know, not create an additional hurdle for those students. I mean, I think if you really looked at a student in that situation that's already finished 10th grade, the chances of them not completing high school just completely, you know, just completely uh, multiply exponentially if, if you're now telling them that they have to enroll in a new school that has maybe different graduation requirements where they have no friends and they don't have a social worker or they don't have a guidance counselor. And, and so I don't think my schools, if, if this legislation passes, I think those students should be, it shouldn't be up to me or, or, or other high school principals or school boards or whoever makes those decisions to, to, um, to close the door on a student that has established educational residency in their district. Thanks. Do we want to hear from Ledge Council on this issue? Or? I can walk through the vote, right? Okay. okay. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, let's start with uh, existing law. Um, so on C1, line 18, I'm oh, sorry, for the record, uh, Jim Damer, Red's Council, uh, walking through, through um, what is this, 
H what? <laughs> 638. 638, thank you. Um, okay, so E1 on line 18 says, for the purposes of this title, the legal residents um, were residents of a child, a uh, parent who are homeless, it is a child's school of origin, which we'll come back to. And unless the parents in another school district agree that the child's attendance in school in that district, sorry, um, will uh, be in the best interest of the child. Um, so already we have in law this involvement of a parent in another school district to make the decision, um, which is replicated below. Um, the uh, Reference to uh, school of origin is above. Uh, that definition is on line 12. It says, as used in this section, school of origin means the school in which the child was enrolled at the time of placement into the custody, custody of the commissioner for children and families or in the case of a student already in the custody, custody the school uh, the, the student most recently attended. So the default for a homeless student is um, school of origin, okay? Uh, the definition of a homeless stu student is um, a child uh, of parents who are homeless. It means it's a child, child whose parents lack a fixed, regular, and adequate residence or have a primary nighttime residence in a supervised publicly or privately <laughs> operated shelter, etc. Um, so this bill doesn't deal with what happens when you're the child of homeless parents. It's already in law. This deal deals with what happens when the parents are no longer homeless. They were homeless, now they're no longer homeless. What happens to that child, okay? So, uh, nine, line nine says, notwithstanding any provision to the contrary under this section, if, I, if a child of parents who are homeless was enrolled in complete grade 10, in Vermont Public School, and the child's parents either during that academic year or during the following two academic years are no longer homeless um, and take up residency in a school district other than the school district in which the child enrolled and completed grade 10, then the child shall be considered to be a legal resident of the school district in which the child completed grade 10 for such time that it takes for the student to graduate from high school unless the child's parents in another school district agree that the child's attendance in school and that school district will be in the best interest of the child. Picking up from the earlier um, language about being homeless and having the, the parents be able to override uh, the school warranty. Okay. Questions? Peter? Uh, I'm just uh, running through various scenarios in my head, so um, I'll try to do this one thinking a little bit out loud. So uh, you are a non-operating district that tuitions all of your kids. Let's just take uh, one of my towns, Hancock. Your family who lives there, Hancock tuitions your child to Harwood. Um, uh, you become homeless uh, and then you move to uh, Virgens. The parents are yeah. um, uh, does that, would this obligate Hancock to continue to pay tuition for this student to attend Harwood? Uh, I would say yes, because the student is entitled to continue his or her education at Harwood for two more years. Yeah. Uh, and the only way that happens is through the tuition payment. So, or does it talk about tuition here expressly? And that's the result. So um, this bill relates to high school, tenth grade, yeah. tenth grade, and then having two more years, assume, or as long as it takes to graduate from high school. How do we do? How does this issue? Are we not including children in, in an elementary school no. who are homeless? No, no grade ten. Said. So, Grade ten on it, I think. Yeah, yeah. Grade 10. Well, that's yeah, yeah that's yeah. the bill yeah. reads. Yeah. My question is, what about all the other kids who are homeless? I think maybe there's a presumption. Oh, sorry. What, no, I mean, go ahead. I, I mean, I guess my interpretation is is that 
with a younger kid, it's just maybe not even um, possible. You know that you'd have to essentially be going where, where you're. That maybe a kid in 11th or 12th grade might have that degree of mobility to get from Winooski to South Burlington, or you, you know I, that's what I was kind of hearing. Maybe I've got that wrong, but just that the practicality of doing it and, and also doing it over. What do you, you know, if it happens in fourth grade, you're going to keep this kid in a different district than the one they live in for eight oh, years, yeah. you know. Um, <clears throat> that's what I was picking up is just. And, and they would have the time to build those those social and support <laughs> networks. Yeah. Well, to me, the transportation for elementary would it's, be the biggest thing. Big thing. Mom and dad would, I'm sure a bus is not going to come to out of a district to take you to another school. So. We're back to being rural and and not having transportation for young people. No, I'm just thinking about what Peter said, and that's really kind of that scenario. They're paying twice, yeah. basically, because yeah. Virgins is still paying. That's right. Wherever they live, that property tax is going. To schools. And Why are they paying twice? Are yeah, they... I don't understand that. Uh, no, I, I not, didn't say they were paying not twice, twice that, that, but the, in the in community the, that's, that's tuitioning is now tuitioning a student that no longer lives in their, in their community. Dish, in their community. So technically, if they move into a house that they're paying property taxes on, that that property tax, regardless, is still no, going to chance. They could say right. they were renting an apartment. Right. Well, actually, so, that's a that's a very good chart twist. Um, I hadn't thought about that. So, so the parents no longer living in Hancock in your scenario. Right. So. Usually it goes, it's the parent's resident that decides where the child goes to school. So if the child, if, if the parents move from, from Hancock to South Burlington, right, I think then the kid still gets to stay in, in, Han in the school, I'm not sure what school, it's just that would. Hardwood, let's just say. Hardwood. They're not, I mean, they're, it's a tuition town. Okay. So, so they get to go to the school they've been in. Uh, but in terms of who pays for that, I don't think it would, it would be because the parents don't want to live there anymore, so that doesn't make sense. Got it. I think it would be Harwood under this bill because that yeah, is right. not a student's legal town right. of right. yeah, yeah, Harwood right. would be counting them as an equalized That's pupil. That's what I was And they would be. Which, because, they, which they wouldn't be if they were being tuition. Because you only count, for right. Indian purposes, you only count students of residence. Yeah. And yeah. the kid would be a student of resident of Harwood. Um, well, I guess if, if we were to move forward with this, I would yeah. maybe clarify that. Yeah, 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 clarify that. Yeah, yeah. Glad we discussed that a second time. Well, I think it can get sticky, especially if it gets into greater volumes. And, you know, I, I co sponsor this bill. I think it, it sounds like a good idea, and I think it's based around basically compassion and wanting to keep the momentum someone has with these services right. as they finish up high school. So I'm all for that. But it, it, it gets really tricky, right? And if you're talking about Chittenden County, if you're talking about South Burlington and Winooski, you're talking about different housing costs. You know, you're talking about something that could be created to be kind of uh, helpful for a small number of students, but then could, you know, look. But now nobody's looking to be homeless for any period of time just so they can move. But it is true in the case that uh, Kathleen was, was talking about, what if a student is homeless and is then placed actually with a new guardian? who doesn't live in that town. In some ways, that would be a benefit that you say, hey, well, I'm being placed with a new guardian in, in Richmond, but I'm going to be able to keep going to South Burlington. It's fine as long as just a couple kids do it. But as soon as, you know, anybody you know, starts to say, oh, well, this is like a good way to kind of keep kids in this district that's really desirable and with people that are in all kinds of different um, communities with different uh, tax rates, it, it just takes the CLA. It could it could really make things tricky if it ever crept to more than like one percent or, right. or people who try to game the system. It, any kind of gaming of the system would would be really would need to be guarded against carefully. But I like the I like the basic concept. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Patrick. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too, Jim. You thank too. you. Back you I, I wanted to go through, before we go through the bill, we've got basically a dumpster fire on the current definition of the teacher requirements. Yeah. So before we go through the bill, I thought we had like a literal, like we had like that. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 
we're not. So I wanted to go see current laws and rule with you to see what the issues are. Then we get we get to that section. We can have a more robust conversation about what to do about it. Thank you. Because uh, I'm not sure what to do about it, frankly, and yeah. it's confusing. Um, there was a dumpster fire in Toronto. Yes, that's, 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 that's why it was be clear. Well, it's an expression for a reason, you know. The, there we go. The, the <laughs> do burn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's go through current law. This is uh, 829, the statute on pre-K. Um, and this is a qualification requirement. It's called pre-qualification in current law. We're not calling it that. But what it says is that a program of pre-K education, whether provided by a school district or a private provider, which covers both, shall have received, uh, um, and then it has the accreditation requirements, right? And then they have to have a licensed provider, question mark, there. It's not clear what that means because we don't use that term in the statute. Um, it's not clear what license means, by whom, or whatever. Okay, that's a question mark. So a licensed provider shall employ, let um, Oh, gosh. So, uh, okay. Shall employ or contract for the services of at least one teacher who is licensed to endorse, etc. Okay. It doesn't say how many hours. It doesn't say what the teacher has to do. Okay. Um, and you're not sure actually who applies to. Is licensed provider just bit, they kind of just. So can I help with yeah. that? Yeah. Um, so the way that the CDC regs are set up, there are licensed uh, center based child care facilities. And then there are licensed and registered family child care homes. And whether they're licensed or registered depends on their size and their ratios. Um, so when we see licensed provider, we're wondering, does that mean all licensed facilities, meaning the licensed center-based and the licensed family child care homes? And then on 3, line 13, registered, does that only mean the registered family child care homes? Or was it just unclear at the time that it was drafted and somebody was using license provider as a shorthand for center-based facilities generally and registered home provider generally to mean all home family child care homes? We're not sure what the original intent was. Is pre-qualified? Was it just meaning pre-qualified providers? Um, these, are the to, these are the requirements to become pre-qualified, right? And this must apply to a school district and private provider so is the school district a license provider? I'm not sure about that either. So anyway, there's a lot of confusion as to what this means. Yeah. Come to this one here. This one says that a registered home provider um, that's not licensed and endorsed. Um, okay, a license, a home provider is not licensed and endorsed. A teacher is. So I'm not sure what that means because it doesn't really make sense. Um, <laughs> But like you could have a teacher who owns a home center, and so in some, but that's not necessarily the norm. Right. That's what. Well, that situation could happen, and that's what we were talking about this morning when we were going through this language. But the way that the bill defines a private provider, it defines it as a program, not a person. Mm -hmm. So okay. even in that situation, this language is, is a little bit unworkable. Mm -hmm. So let's read through it. There, a virtual home provider that is not licensed and endorsed in early childhood education. Shall receive regular active supervision and training from a teacher who is licensed and endorsed. Okay, okay, it doesn't have many hours, but it does say what they have to do. <laughs> so it says supervision and training. So, unlike this one, which doesn't say what the teacher has to do, at least this one gives some direction that it's about supervision and training, but it doesn't say how many hours. That's current law. Okay, current rules this is rule 2605. Um, so it says that in addition to being applicable or early childhood program licensing regulations, etc., here are, here are the staff requirements. So teachers in pre-K classrooms <laughs> in public schools shall hold a valid educational license with an endorsement. Okay, doesn't say what they have to do. Doesn't say how many hours. Okay, um, and then it goes on to say. Uh, private pre-qualified um, uh, providers are Sarah based okay, shall employ for the services of a, a licensed teacher. Um, it says that it has to be for 10 hours. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't say whether the teacher has to teach or supervise, mm -hmm. so we're not clear as to what the teacher has to do, but 10 hours have been put, put in by, by rule. And then the operator of, of a family uh, child care home has three options to, to, to meet this requirement. The first option is that the operator holds a valid Vermont Edge Care license to uh, at this point. Um, that's one option. Or B, the operator employs a contract to the services of a teacher who holds that license um, for at least 10 hours per week. So that tells you that it's 10 hours, but again, doesn't tell you what they have to be doing in the classroom. And then just see, to actually, what's it, just to make it clear, we're talking about a home-based one, not a that center. One so, and we've been talking about three hours. That says ten hours. That says ten. And three was somewhere in a statute. Right? There's 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 next. Yeah. So there are three options that are applying here. One, the operator holds the license. Two, you have ten hours of teaching time, or ten hours of teacher time, not teaching necessarily. Oh, teachers, and then C, the program receives regular hands-on active okay. training and supervision. From a teacher who holds a valid Vermont Educator license um, um, for at least three hours per week. So, just, uh, just to clarify, then A is if you're licensed, B is if you have someone coming in for 10 hours, and C is if you have someone coming in for three hours providing yeah, supervision. Yeah. All three are options for that. All three are options. So, so, when we talk about, we talked yesterday after your committee meeting about maintaining the status quo. This is the status quo, yeah. and this is really confusing. Yeah. So as we try to put the status quo into this draft, into the format of this draft, we're not even sure that we got it right, frankly. Um, so we'll go through it, but that gives you the background for why it's difficult. Yeah. Jim, what's the difference between B and C? B and C, so these are all options showing up here for a, <laughs> all options for a child care home. Right, but B is says 10 hours you contract. Yep. And then C says three, three hours, hours Four. with a teacher. So it, why would he hands, hands Because the, the, what, so, I think with this, I, I interpret this, and this is my own like guess, that the 10 hours here is really for direct instruction. Um, because this one's for active supervision and training. So if you're not going to do towers of direct instruction, then you have to have someone. But that's just my guess as to, as to what that tower means. So why would you pay somebody? Nobody would do this. I, I think yeah. nobody probably yeah. does this, because yeah. I can either yeah. do it by having the operator license, or it will yeah. get three hours. Well, it's interesting that C doesn't even refer to contracting or employing. It just says receiving. Like, you could, I guess it's hard to be supervised by somebody you don't have a contract with, but it's just interesting that you say, Employs your contract with yeah. the services, and then down below, just say, "Hey, you receive it." Yeah. Is he, you can just have a friendly, licensed teacher that swims in. But, you know, it'd be interesting to see how often that is happening. I, I think there is a solution to all this, which is which is not in the current language of the bill. I'm not sure how to approach the current language of the bill, but you do have the back of your bill. This group that's studying all this stuff. I think we can put back in there. We already have language about recommendations as to how things should work, we should be more specific about there and say, how should it work for center-based, for home-based, for home-based that has an uh, operator with a license for that one. All the variations uh, and get a recommendation a year from now as to how it all should play out for all these categories. So um, we will be getting, um, if the when this bill ever passes, we should be getting a report back on sort of current practice. And then this would be asking what is this would be saying, what, what is our, our best practice? What's well, yeah. the recommendation Correct, for our yeah. best practice? I think, and though we might have imperfect, as I figured, but going forward, hopefully we'll get it right because we got a recommendation. Did you just say proficiency? No. 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 I did not say proficiency. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to avoid that topic for now. Yes. <laughs> okay, so that takes us, are we okay with this? Can we yeah, okay, so, so it's, it's very clear <laughs> that uh, going back to what's currently in the statute is not very clear. Yeah, or in rule. Or in rule. And we, it, it, Jim, what you're saying is we can't solve this easily. The better approach would be to let the sort of study committee. 
I think two things. I think it's like, it's like to me it would be great to get a recommendation no matter what, yeah. Yeah. Or maybe going forward, I think. But the solving currently, maybe the agencies can, because there's practice happening out there, and we should probably write SAS co to reflect current practice. I'm not sure what that even is. So maybe yeah. you can approach it that way for this draft. Um, I, I think that sounds reasonable. Yeah. We, we tried. Welcome to what we tried to do. Yeah. Okay, should, should we go into the draft? Yeah, okay. sure. Thank you. Thank you for, for clearing that, uh, clarifying the confusion. <laughs> I was just expressing the confusion. I wasn't clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where do we start here? Uh, okay. All right, so. We have this definition of pre-K education. It used to have more words after this uh, last uh, word standard here. That was uh, talking about how you go about um, uh, uh, teaching pre-K with um, qualified teachers, etc. That's been taken out of here, and you'll see it later on in the back of the bill as we talked about findings and purpose behind the study that you're doing. There's a whole new uh, subsection on that, and you'll find that language back there. Yeah, I, again, I'd like to advocate for having Vermont Early Learning Standards being capitalized. That's not how they, they do, they write, right. they have very, you, you talk about how you, how you write bills and, and yeah. where things get capitalized. We don't okay. have control over yeah. that. Yeah, we have As long guidelines. as they know there's a document that people should be using called Vermont Bells, Vermont Early Learning Standards. Uh, okay. It's yeah. a specific document. It's not just something random, you know, just, is that what that, if you read that, would you know to go to that document? I wouldn't even know what the document is. Oh, okay. But, 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 but we could probably cross-reference it. That would be great. Is is it, that but be where's it live? Is it living on a website, like with no, AOE? I just will ask them if that's necessary. This is, this is the conventions that they use. They even added a few years ago that some <coughs> capitalized. They used to have nothing capitalized. Well, this yeah. here is, is current current law. Right. So yeah. whatever they're doing now is a, is a change in it. I personally don't see the need to do that. Um, I don't know if other people do. <clears throat> I guess I would be concerned if you if you capitalized it. Um, we are getting really down here in the weeds. <laughs> uh, uh, that it would limit it to just the document and and wouldn't be allowing in other standards that might exist that aren't in the VELS document. To me, this is more inclusive of not only VELS, but any other yeah, really other standards we might I, have. I, can, I just can, we, can we put that aside for now? It's probably one of the most important things in this bill, as far as I'm concerned. But um, it, it actually come, comes later in, in terms of um, how they assess progress and the data that they take is addressed elsewhere. But, We'll deal with that later. Okay. All right. Uh, then we're going to go up to mm, up here. Um, okay. So we define what it means to expand a pre-K program. So it says it's used in the subdivision four. The expansion of a pre-K education program means an increase in the number of children served in the program, where the increase would require. Um, additional teachers or classes. And that's the definition from the state board rules that Sandra uh, gave us. Require additional teachers or classes. That works. Okay, here we get into the dumpster fire, and I'll give it to Kate. Okay. <laughs> 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 I was there. So what we've done is we still have it broken down into two paragraphs, um, and then the first paragraph deals with just center-based child care programs. So if you remember, the existing language talked about licensed providers. Um, a licensed provider technically is a family child care home. It could be because they can be licensed, but we kept all the family child care home um, together in paragraph two. We were thinking that was closer to the intent. Um, so in paragraph one, for a private provider that's regulated as a center-based child care home, employing or contracting for the service of at least one teacher who is licensed and endorsed an early childhood education or early childhood special education. This doesn't say anything about 
what the activity is. Is it direct instruction? Is it supervision? It's silent on that, and it doesn't say anything about the hours. As in current law. As in current law. Second paragraph, um, for a private provider that is regulated as a family child care home, the word regulated encompasses both the licensed and the registered homes. Um, and it says, um, so for a private provider regulated as a family child care home that is not operated by a person who is licensed and endorsed in early childhood ed or special ed, so somebody without a teacher's license, the provider shall receive regular active supervision and training from a teacher who is licensed and endorsed in early childhood education or in early childhood special education. So if you're a <coughs> family child care home, you don't have a teacher's license, the provider is um, shall receive regular active supervision and training from somebody who does have a license. It doesn't specify the number of hours. So in current law, that was the one where it was three or ten, right? It was, well, yes, it was broken into three different categories. Under the state board <laughs> rules, not under current statute. This, yeah, reflects, board. this reflects current statute. This, we think, reflects current statute. So this could actually take us backwards as, as possible. Meaning? Meaning that the, the amount of time that had a, a teacher in the classroom could be reduced. So right now the current statute doesn't say anything about no. ours. It's all in the rule, and this doesn't change the rule. Right. Uh, I see. It didn't have three hours in statute? No. No. Or no. ten. Okay. Um, Caleb? No, no, no. Go ahead, Caleb. Um, Right, I guess that the part of that was my question that so that, that Chris asked, but I, I had a comment kind of from before after we looked at the situations that currently exist, which is in some ways it makes sense given how much variety you saw on your 28 program tour, and we can see just in the just on the Addison County tour that I was part of the one day, it, it in some ways makes sense that we could see the level of uh, just permutation that we see within these programs because these rules are, between the rule and the statute, it is pretty, uh, pretty open to interpretation. And that, and, and that does seem kind of borne out by our current marketplace. And we'll be looking to, for recommendations to tighten this up. My, my question goes to line 16, I guess. What is, what does regular Line 16. Line 16. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not active supervision, regular can, can active supervision. It's not a defined term, but it comes from your existing law. So it's what you currently have in statute, regular active supervision and training. And then the, the, rule, the rules. The, the rules, yeah. rules that define it. Mm -hmm. Well, regular means three hours. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> per week. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. Or ten. <laughs> so I'd be curious if the agencies come in and tell us that this that is not nice. reflecting current their view of current law or practice. It'd be useful to know. Yeah. I think because we're guessing as to we're not guessing, but we're trying to use our best. Okay. All right. So moving on from that. Um, so the public side, so now we're on the public requirements. Um, so again, we've gone back to just put in the current law for public programs, which is that the employee or contract for the service is at least one teacher with license and endorsed. So under the previous version of this bill, last version, this had that it had to be um, uh, direct instruction, and it had to be teaching for the full day of the, the program. That's not what current law says. This is what current law says. So we're going back and putting that back in again, um, trying to keep the status quo. I'm sorry, that's, that's just for the privates, right? This is public, you know, we're in the public. Okay, so, the public so we definitely, there's, there's some challenge I'm hearing to that, that if we include that language, does that mean that we also bring the whole agency of human services back into oversight? With the STARS part. With the stars part. That's not what this is, though. We're not there. This is, this is the requirement to have a teacher in, in, in the class. Okay. So, the okay. last version of the bill for public programs, public programs, it said that the teacher had to provide direct instruction, 
and had to be there for the entire day. I guess I'm going up to yeah. so lines one and two. Yeah. So yeah, um, and we re reverse back the current law mm -hmm. on this. So there's no no talk now about drug construction or on on a number of hours. This up here, um, this qualification requirement. Um, yeah, this would pull if you want to comply by getting uh, uh, four stars. You have to, as a public provider, have to comply with AHS's requirements under that program. Is there a way to make sure we're not dragging the whole agency over as well? Uh, That's what my concern. So is. you have language. Could we skip to page eleven? Page eleven, when we talk about regulatory oversight and rules. Okay. Um, we have on line 10, AOE shall have sole regulatory oversight of pre-K education programs offered by public providers with the exceptions that we have two exceptions. So the first is you um, receive CCFAP, then AHS oversees compliance with CCFAP, but the second is if the public provider chooses to st satisfy program quality requirements using the four stars, then DCF shall have regulatory oversight of the provider's compliance and STARS only, not the whole program, but their compliance with STARS. And that would be public school's choice, <clears throat> yes, if they want to do that. Well, it's and a choice between, you really don't have a choice between STARS and, and ACC. ACC. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure how intrusive uh, STARS oversight is. I just don't yeah. know. Maybe that's for the agencies that this fire. I know that, that that's a concern. Yeah. Like it as a concern that we've heard. Because I think the reason to have the stars was that it was something that parents could c compare, and the stars was useful for that. But if it is just that, that concern, I don't find out what that means. Okay, so let me go on from here. So you were on page seven, sorry. I'm yeah, but there were no, no changes. No changes. No changes. Just a, there's really not, it doesn't seem plausible that AOE could administer STARS qualification. I mean, that doesn't seem too credible, right? So it's, it's sort of like um, if a public program wants to have the STARS, I don't really see that there's any other way for them to get it than to go through the people that regulate STARS. So maybe it's just like if, the, if NACI is the other option, maybe the question is like, is NACI going to work for the public schools? And it's, 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 much, it's a much higher standard. So do we think the public schools are going to want the STARS? Are we the questions that we'll ask them. We'll tell that when we get the, the books. Because that does seem like a pretty big threat yes. to trying to bifurcate our regulation. And we have the school boards in the room, so um, we'll be asking for feedback from them on that. OK. okay. So you asked for findings and purpose. Um, this is usually oh, sure. Yeah. I can do this. Um, so we had talked a little bit of, about language, legislative intent around the direct instruction concept. Why are we, why are we asking for all this information back? So um, in subsection A, you're kind of building your case as to why this information is important. First, in subdivision one, pre-kindergarten education is provided in Vermont through a mixed delivery system by a combination of private providers which are regulated either as center-based child care programs or family child care homes and by public schools. In subdivision two, a private center-based provider is required to employ or contract with a teacher with a valid Vermont educator license and an endorsement in either early childhood education or early childhood special education, which we're calling for the purposes of this section a qualified teacher. A family child care home is also required to employ or contract with a qualified teacher unless the operator of the family child care home is a qualified teacher. Subdivision three, while public schools retain qualified teachers to provide direct instruction to pre-K students, under current law, private providers retain qualified teachers to either provide direct instruction to pre-K students or training and supervision to the provider's staff or both. Subdivision four, the General Assembly finds that it is best practice for pre-K education to be delivered through the implementation of high quality, effective, direct instruction by qualified educators who use evidence-based practices within intentionally designed early learning environments. Which is pretty much the language that came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Yeah. 
Subdivision 5. However, the General Assembly recognizes that there may be some challenges to requiring private providers to retain qualified teachers to solely provide direct instruction, which may include a lack of qualified teachers in Vermont and the financial impact this requirement may have on private providers and families. Six, therefore, the General Assembly is commissioning this study under subsection B of this section in order to better understand the issues and concerns that may arise if private providers were required to retain qualified teachers to solely provide direct instruction for all or portion of the pre-K education hours that are publicly funded. Well, I'm just going to talk. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was waiting to be recognized. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just being polite. You were. Um, <coughs> typo and solely. Sorry. I'm an editor. Oh. <clears throat> You've got solely spelled wrong twice. Um, oh, thank you. Go, sure. Going up, the thing I'm confused about is that I thought I saw something earlier. It was one of our yellow highlighted sections that implied to me that licensed teachers were not required to provide direct instruction at public schools. And that was news to me, and I don't know where I where I thought I saw that already. Well, I should have flagged it at a time. I'm sorry. It's here. Um, let's see. While public schools retain qualified teachers to provide direct instruction, it doesn't say they require to under law, but they do in fact, right? So I was careful of wording that sentence that not to make it like a legal requirement. Okay. So up above where I saw that it looked like they weren't required to, that in fact is true, but they all do. <laughs> in, pra in practice. And the current law is not clear what they're supposed to do in the public classroom. So yeah. I'm dragging us back into the flaming dumpster. Yeah, you are. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. But this, this right in here is a little bit carefully drafted well, not to say it's a legal okay. requirement, but I do believe that public teachers are teaching. Under contract, yeah. In, in public schools. Yeah. Um, so that's why I wrote. And then, then this says under current law, Private providers can either do do either direct or or supervision. Um, so I think it's correct. Make sense? Yeah, sure. Sure. So I I understand what you said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, then going on uh, to B B is where we have the um, language of the of the study, which we've done through before, number of teachers who are qualified, etc. But there's some new language here, and that new language is in 8. Um, oh, sure. Um, so this is the, um, all the different factors that are going to be looked at in the study, and there's a new one on 8 recommendations on how many hours of direct instruction by qualified teachers should be required in center-based child care programs and family child care homes if they're qualified under this act, uh, taking into account the General Assembly's goal to have pre-K education be delivered through the implementation of high quality effective direct instruction by qualified teachers who use evidence-based practices with intentionally designed early learning environments. That's this, that same language. This is where I think we could do more. So this is where I think we could say recommend, but recommend it not just like for these categories, but list out by list. Mm -hmm. Regular center based uh, family homes that have an operator who's licensed, family homes that have, don't have it. So make sure that they're looking at every category. Right. How many hours and what the, they should be doing, if teachers should be doing in those settings. And we're already going to get information on what they're doing now. So yeah. We're going to have that information yeah. of what it looks like. Yeah. What the land is now. Yeah. So this should be revised a little bit further, I think, just yeah. to put that list in. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, again, I, I think it might be helpful for us to have a definition of, of evidence-based practices, because just about every evidence-based practice, every practice <coughs> evidence-based is just whether it's good evidence. And we there was a really good definition of evidence-based, not in here, but I'm just wondering just to, when we say evidence-based, what do we mean by that? Is it you know, validated, is it, uh... I don't know, actually, what it means. I mean, it came from language that... But, um, but I'm sure there's a definition that could be used. But yeah, sure uh, we is. saw a definition a, a, long, a while back that I thought was excellent when we were looking 
it, it was embedded. It was embedded in the definition of structured uh, uh, literacy. literacy. Yeah. Part of that was around yes. urban space. Was part I, of that I really like that definition, and I'm just wondering if we could use that as that's what we mean when we say evidence base. This is what we're using. I would imagine that um, that if someone has evidence, people have evidence that vaccines will kill you. <laughs> But um, people have, and I'm jumping into your fire along with Kathleen. Well, what, what would the harm be? They do that a reference to a definition. We can, we can look, look for one. And I'll, I'll task you to see if we can find a good definition. Okay. Well, okay. Jim, you know the definition that I'm talking about? I know it's, it's in the social literacy bill. Right. I'm not sure if it defines the evidence base, but uses the term. So we should. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll look too. It's in that spreadsheet there, yeah. there, there, yeah. on the on the, I'm sorry, on the literacy bill. Um, the other change here is on page 26. This deals with the um, census-based uh, uh, funding advisory group, um, uh, which is doing a few things. Remember, it was uh, doing, uh, looking at pre-K students to ensure that they attend an our district program. They still get special services. And two below here, which you can't see, talks about uh, making sure we're not paying twice for early education. Um, but now it says up here that uh, the advisory group, in collaboration with private pre-K education providers, pre-K coordinators, and pre-K teachers, where representatives of each of these three groups are selected by the advisory group, where each group represents different geographic regions within the state, shall so study. So it's a, it's a collaborative effort now with those groups. <coughs> and so the, the advisory group was adding those people, or they were consulting with those people. Consulting with them. Consulting. Yeah, 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 yeah. In collaboration with them. In collaboration. Them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then we have a placeholder for a uh, section uh, pre-K coordinators grant program, which mm -hmm. is to come. And then we had to adjust the uh, effective dates a little bit to reflect section changes. Um, that's it. This is why we pay you the big bucks. <laughs> Thank you. Section 8 language to come, is that responding to um, the testimony from Let's Grow Kids? Pre-K coordinators. Pre-K coordinators are great thing? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. We, we um, yeah, it, it's part of the whole process of scaling up what's, mm -hmm. good, what's going well. Wow. Thank you. Thoughts? Mm. Well, I like the <clears throat> legislative intent and the study. I like how that's all worded. I'm happy we added that. <clears throat> Quiet. This is kind of amazing. Um, yeah. Yesterday I read through Lori Connors. She yeah. sent New Mexico's pre K 217 to 18 annual report mm -hmm. that I got partway through yesterday. But it's pretty detailed report on what's going on in pre K. And I wonder if we'd ever get to that point where we would have the AOE providing a report like that. Well, the AOE, do we left this as an outside report? Is that, did we do that, or did we, I can't remember who's doing this. Is this something that the, that the agencies are going to be yeah, providing? Yes. Or is yeah. this something they're asking an outside group to do? Agencies are doing it. Agencies are doing it. Okay. So, but it's a separate, it's a different report than this. This would be just an annual report. This New Mexico report is just an annual report on how yeah. the pre-K program is doing, and it looked pretty thorough. We, and, we get it. We get an annual report now, but I believe that they might be sunsetting it upstairs in government operations. <laughs> so I think we need Why to. Why not? I, I'm not sure what's happening with that. Yeah, Whether we have a chance, sure just kind of scan through that. It's pretty impressive. Um, I will. I'm very happy to send this to um, to Lori. Just go to Lori and get her feedback. I think. Um, I do need to see what's happening with the report. Um, I'll see if I can find the 
the notice that I got from um, GovOps that they were planning to sunset that report. It was an annual report, um, and they were looking at um, repealing it or sunsetting it. And um, I'm not sure what the report. So that report was probably in 166, right? The request for that report. Probably, yeah. Was it in 166, or it could have been even in 52 or 62. I can find that for you if you want to. Yeah, to let's let's take yeah. a look yeah. at that. That'd be great. Thank yeah. you. I do think this is something we're going to be wanting to continue to get uh, okay. uh, feedback okay. Okay. So okay. Too. Right. as we as go forward. Okay. okay, so I think we will just get. Um, we need to we need to work on the um, pre-K coordinator grant program. Um, I'm assuming that would be money that we would take off the top of the Ed fund, along with any other matching funds that came from other organizations <laughs> that might help with that. Um, and how we set that up, we need some guidance. Lots of guidance. But I really appreciate this work. Um, how are we doing? Improvement from work yesterday. Yeah. yeah. This is not, not everybody is going to be happy with everything. It's not going to happen. My experience is when everybody hates it, we've got it right. <laughs> but I think that we're working towards something that's a little bit better than that. Everybody will hate something. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks, though. So we would like to get some feedback. Um, from the school boards, from the privates on this new plan. Yeah. Um, what else do we need to hear from, from the agencies? We are going to be hearing from the agencies this afternoon. This afternoon. Good. Do you want to respond to this now? No. You probably don't want to respond to this yet, right? No. Okay. <laughs> You want to do something like you can hear? Maybe read it, yeah. yeah maybe read it. <laughs> it's always good. Um, there is some good news that there may be some hope coming from the Commerce and Economic Development Bill to help with workforce development. So we'll be following that. Um, that can help with child care and pre-K. Um, we have... I, just a quick thing, yeah. um, just in H270 at 2014, which is what turned into 166, the only report I'm finding in there is a report on enrollment and access, which was due January 1st, 2018, that would have been coming from AHS and the BBF Council. Okay, so we want that. We'll yeah, so I don't know if that ever that. came in January of 2018. It, 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 we, we got one, the yeah. report that yeah. we went through the other day, just, Obviously, it does not come in January. This year, it came in May. But is that this doesn't cause this kind of refers to it almost as a one time. So I don't know if this is the one you're talking about. It doesn't it doesn't call it on annual. It just says it's 2014 when they write it, and they're going to come back in 2018. So I don't know. Okay. Anyway, there I don't see, I don't see that annual bill. The, the earlier pre-K bill. I've forgotten what number that was. 62. 62. Uh, 62, I think. 62. Yeah. 62. There might be something in 62 that we could ask for that. But let's, let's, um, let's look at what we want for an annual report. And Sarita, you're going to work on evidence-based definitions. Yeah. And how do we use it with bells? What are we going to, like, reference in bells? Uh, because if those are our standards for yeah. Vermont standards, right. why won't we be... It's a yeah. drafting convention. Get in there. It's, a, it's a drafting convention. Thank you. Okay. It's a drafting convention. They don't. You, if you go through, you'll see a lot of things. You say, "Why isn't that happening?" No, no, no. Can't. But can we put it as a reference? But that I, I don't know. Because it's what a, do, do people want to put that? Who wants to? There are there, there are standards. Ones that are reference standards. standards. But to me, it's clear. clear. But you know. I, I just think we need to follow the the proofers and the drafters their conventions because they're trying to make uniform our statutes and so it, what we perceive to be the correct reference is not what our drafters are telling us 
And what they say goes, because it's in the green books, is that, I mean, we control the substance, but they really control the presentation. It's like if you write a book, you listen to your editor. Okay. Yeah, which is tough, but... It, Can I just read the introduction to the Bell's standards? Can I just read it? It will take two seconds to this whole curriculum document. Early experience matters, whether at home, with family, child care, preschool, kindergarten, primary grades, neighborhood, and community. The importance of high quality early childhood experiences that are research based is a foundation for school success and lifelong learning. Bells, the Vermont Early Learning Standards, make explicit the goals for each and every child's learning and development from birth through grade three. Think of Bells as a roadmap that helps to guide understanding of what a, what a child may know and do across the early learning years. So it's very specific in all different areas. And I think that's Vermont. That's that's the standards. Like we have standards, you know, we have K-12 standards, we have early childhood standards. That's what we should be implementing. I don't even know if we know that if they're being implemented in the private sector. So, so it's all through definitions are in the uh, PK um, rules. Yep. A definition is developly appropriate and, and it has to do with being aligned with the Vermont Early Learning Standards. Um, so it, here it is, You're what we can with the Department of Education is. Um, it, it's Vermont Early Learning Bells. It, it's, all it's all addressed in rule. Okay. And I, I'm with Dylan that I don't want to go over the drafters yeah. in the way that they, they've actually added more. Okay. Agency and secretaries now have, have now. It's not. I don't. It's not like that's not important to me. What's important to me is that in private sectors and public sectors, I assume in public sectors they're doing this. Yes. What I don't know is in the private sector no, they're if they're following these. It's part of TS goal. And who is yeah. monitoring yeah. that? Who is making sure yeah. that they're following these standards? The agencies, and they have a report. There's a report okay. on that. And on, I think it was was it in that report that talked about meeting the, the standards um, in the way that we saw yesterday. Um, Agency of Education, TS Gold results. Sorry, <laughs> for the record, Ted Fisher, Vermont Agency of Education. What was, what was the question? Um, I the, the data on on uh, bills, uh, on TS Gold. Yeah, um, we we provide a report yeah. annually, and that was the one. Okay. If I remember correctly, yeah. and I'd have to check because it's I'm relying on my memory here. Yeah. Um, this that's the one that we it's due in in descent in January, but we use fall data, and the fall data is never available in January, so we give it to you in. It's April. the one we've done. And we love to change. Yes. That. And we got it in May, and yeah. we were looking at it yesterday. Okay. That was the one that we had up. So I, I do want to appreciate your um, just want some wanting to make sure that that children are being assessed, that they're following standards, okay. and it's happening in the public and private. Okay. Yeah. That's I just cool. want to state for the record that we interpret that this sec subsection subdivision two of of Section 829 as to, to mean the Vermont Early Learning Standards in capitals. Yeah. You know, it's, I think it's maybe a branding question a little bit, but yeah, the document lives on our website. Um, and then you monitor, you make sure the private schools also <coughs> into and see that That's a good question for Kate Rogers, but, but when we read the statute, that's what it means to us. Um, when we did the tour, the private providers were talking about some of the challenges that they had in doing it, but they are doing it. Okay. Just consistency, you yeah. know, that, that it's just con being implemented yeah. consistent throughout the state. That's I, do, I do appreciate your point to make sure that those things are there. Okay. <laughs> um, we are now up to... H one twelve, eight one twelve. That is work here. Work is here. Great. This is going to be an update on um, you. These people are invited. Um, were you prepared to 
Were you prepared to testify or are you here listening? I think I'm mostly here to listen. Okay. But, um, okay, so I think um, I see Faye, right? Good morning. Hi, and I have on the, the list, I have um, Hunger Free Vermont, I have Wade River Valley School, and I have South Burlington District. Yes. Burlington District. Burlington. Burlington. Burlington District, excuse me. So I think probably those are the people we want to hear from. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. So, Anor, perhaps you could start. And we have um, we have to be on the floor at 10:30. So. Good morning. For the record, I'm Anor Horton. I'm the executive director of Hunger Free Vermont. I'd like to thank you, Madam Chair and committee members, for making some time for us today to talk about. H12, a bill to provide universal school meals to all Vermont public school students. Um, and I, uh, we sent to you yesterday a, I acknowledge, long and dense <laughs> document um, that goes through um, the impacts and um, our, uh, our and Public Assets Institute's cost assessment for um, universal school meals. And my understanding is that um, the committee in particular wants to have some conversation today about um, the preliminary um, cost estimates and some of the other issues that were raised the last time that H12 was discussed and some of the data that um, Mark presented from the JFO. So, um, so that's what, um, I'll focus on today. Um, and um, I just, I want to start by saying that the reason why Hunger Free Vermont supports this bill is that we have lots and lots of research that makes it really clear that school meals are a critical educational support. That when students have regular, consistent access to healthy school breakfast and lunch, their ability to learn improves, their math and English language arts test scores improve, their health improves, their behavior improves, the school climate improves, the relationship of lower income families to the school improves, and the experience of teaching and administering schools also improves. Um, and in order for school meals to be, to serve all of these great educational support roles, they have to be equitably accessible to all students. And so, so our commitment to that um, is one reason why we support H12. The other reason why we support H12 is that the way the, the traditional way that the federal meal programs are structured does not work to deliver that equitable access um, of school meals to all students. So we just want to keep in mind the reason why we're here talking about the impacts and cost of having Vermont as a state um, support schools in providing universal school meals. Um, I'm going to say a few things um, just based on Hunger Free Vermont's statewide experience of providing technical assistance to schools, helping schools use the traditional school meal programs, um, and also helping 23% uh, of Vermont public schools and 26% of all Vermont schools transition to a universal school meals model over the last six years. But I also um, want to take as little time as possible of me speaking because we also have um, some real on the ground experts here with us today and we want to make sure that um, you can ask them questions. They'll be um, even better able to answer than, than I will be. Great. Since we have a hard stop, 10:30. I just want to make sure that, that we do get to Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, so given, given the limited time that we have, I'm just going to say a couple things and then give you the opportunity to ask me some questions. And maybe we can redirect some of those questions to um, our school-based experts as well. Does that sound good? I, I think if we can get them in the chair, 
Yes. And then we can ask questions of all of you all oh, together. Oh, okay, great. Would be what I would. Well, what maybe I we should time. just do, should we just do that now? Sounds good. Why don't we okay. do that? That's good. Yeah. Do we have more chairs? <laughs> Let's be efficient. Also back. We have one behind the door. Hi. Doug, come on up too. This is the share of desk. That's a one. The share of desk. Welcome. For the record, could you tell us your name? Absolutely. Hi, I'm Carlotta Simon Parantoni, uh, the principal at Waits River Valley School in East Corinth. My name is Doug Davis. I'm the director of the Burlington School Food Project, uh, part of the Burlington School District. Thank you. Great. Um, all right, so um, I'll just lay out a few points that we might want to talk about and then ask us what you want to ask us. Um, so first, first of all, um, school meal program budgeting is very complex. And the way that schools and school districts pay for school meals is very complex. And on the first page of the testimony I submitted yesterday, we provided a long list of all the different ways that schools cobble together funding for their school meal programs. Um, so federal per meal reimbursements and USDA foods, otherwise uh, what used to be called commodity foods, um, are critical, critical components to funding school meals. But they cover about half of the cost of what it takes to operate school meal programs. And um, under the proposed um, shift to universal school meals in H12 that would all that would all continue so the universal school meals bill as it's written is designed to ensure maximizing federal reimbursement coming into Vermont and going to Vermont schools to cover the cost of school meal programs and in fact it would increase the amount of federal reimbursement that is coming into Vermont by about 10 million dollars a year that just being cut? Right now, no, it's not. No. Um, so the tweet I read is not accurate. So um, there are movements afoot at the federal level to change the nutritional requirements of the school meal program, and we don't like that at all. We think it's terrible, but it's not a cut to the funding. So that is not currently on the table at the federal level. Um, so. So that's, that's um, one piece. Um, another, another point that was raised that we might want to talk about is the way in which schools collect income data from families and how that would and wouldn't change. Um, briefly, there will still be mechanisms for schools to collect the income data they need. And um, these two fine people can talk about their on the ground experience of doing that under a universal school meals model. Um, it's really um, an important part of the bill is that it requires schools to use one of the federal provisions to provide universal school meals. And those provisions require that every student have the opportunity to eat school meals at no charge to families. And we think this is really critical. Um, because of the way that it improves the overall operation of the meal program and the way that it eliminates one of the most harmful aspects of the way the current federal programs operate, which is that it distinguishes and categorizes students by their family income. And it um, has those, some students um, have to deal with not having enough money to cover the cost of their school meals. It ha requires schools to go after parents for unpaid school meal debt. And those are things that are just very, very harmful in many ways, and we want them to be so eliminated. I'm going to stop you for a 
for, for a minute here because yeah. we have heard a lot of this information okay. uh, already and I, we have to teach two people here Great. that are on the ground. Great. So I'm thinking perhaps it would be better use for us to hear from them. Great. Let's do that. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so, uh, Waits River Valley School, this is our seventh, sixth, seventh year of participating in the Universal Meal Program. This current year, we have shifted to the Provision 2 part of the Universal Meals, so we're still uh, acclimating to that. However, um, it's been a pretty, it's not, it has been a phenomenal shift in our system as a whole and in our participation levels um, when all scholars can have lunch, breakfast, and we have the fresh fruit and vegetable grant as well. Um, not only around the fiscal pieces, but the equitable pieces and the health pieces. Um, we provide food that is safe for the allergies and such, so there's no food coming in from homes to monitor and shift and, and look at that. It's a safe environment uh, within the entire school system. Um, so nobody's bringing, no one's bringing we, that? We added to our procedures and, and didn't have any pushback that there are scholars, of course, who require um, um, some additional food during the day or specific food, but that occurs in the nurse's space mm -hmm. so that all of the building itself where the bulk of the scholars are is a, a safe environment. Um, as well, again, it limits um, the separation, socioeconomic separation of who's bringing what for snacks and, and such. So it's, it's truly an equitable opportunity. But um, uh, I can tell you anything about it specific to what your questions are. But as far as receiving the paperwork and such, we have never had a problem. We have 100% of our uh, families who submit the required paperwork to free and reduce lunches at the start of the year. We clearly tell them that we receive a lot of grants, we have title funding, um, our consolidated federal programming component. There's so many aspects that pertain to the data that we collect from that, even our achievement data for our academic progress is based on that information. Um, so we do a lot of PR work on that, but it's it's great stuff with um, connecting, celebrating um, the the few families. I think this year there were about 12 that we didn't receive the paperwork from. I took that opportunity to individually reach out to them and do that paperwork with them so that we had that. We can hear from okay. Burlington and then sure. we'll open it up. Uh, my name is Doug Davis. I have been at Burlington since 1997. Um, I think I'm gain on 30 years in child nutrition programs. Uh, Burlington was the first school to dabble into universal meals. Um, we started in 1999, so it is something that's been happening in Burlington and is part of the fabric since that time. Uh, we entered into provision two because at the time, the community eligibility provision that Anor described in her testimony um, didn't exist. Um, we reached out to uh, agencies of education around the country because it was new to Vermont, so we wanted to get some information as to how to best implement it here. That um, best information we got was from, happened to be from Ohio at the time, because Cleveland also had just gone through that change. So we are still, um, we're, we're still doing provision two at two of our sites, I'm sorry, at three of our sites. However, we have now transitioned our um, other schools of low income to CEP. Um, the reason I bring that up is um, the CEP model has to recertify every four years. So we have gone through that recertification process many times since 2000. I think it would have been four or five times by now, depending on the, the way the calendar fell. And in order to do that, we have to justify that the socioeconomic levels within our community, the community we serve, has not changed in a substantial way. And the USDA defines substantial as 5% up or down. And Burlington has been able to continue serving through Provision 2. Uh, the Provision 2 model that we use is breakfast only because from a financial standpoint, uh, we are not able to provide lunch at this time for the Edmonds Complex, which is a K-8, VHS, and um, Champlain. Um, however, um, those schools still need to provide free and reduced meal data because we are still serving a traditional lunch, even though it's a free breakfast. So we kind of have 
the split um, within our school. And I can share that that for parents is a little confusing. Um, I would love to be able to offer um, universal meals to all of our kids. We do see that there is definitely a divide. Um, I was in my cafeteria, actually Edmonds, the other day. Um, and this really struck me. Um, I was sitting with a student, and she was with an adult. The student shared, or the adult shared with me that this student had spent the summer um, in France watching the women's uh, soccer, what is that, like the World Cup? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's a student in the back of the cafeteria going through the box to see what boots fit. So I think that regardless of income, and when I say boots fit, I mean it's in the lost and found. This child is trying to get boots to go out to recess. Um, and I think that that is the picture that we really need to have in our minds when we're looking at what equity means, because these students are all being served in the same cafeteria. The students are all being served in the same classrooms. So what we have found is by exercising an entire um, um, opportunity for universal meals, it takes out so much of that um, division within our students. Now, if we move to the new North End where everybody now is free for um, under the community eligibility provision, we have seen that really change the dynamics within our school. Um, our program folks, our, um, <coughs> our lunch team is in classrooms more. We're able to really get to our teachers and say to them, you know, the same as Carlotta mentioned about the fresh fruit and veggie, we don't have classroom parties. That's not true. We try not to have classroom parties because we can offer them um, strawberry, um, grapes, whatever, to take the place of um, Valentine's Day um, parties or Halloween parties, taking into account families' concern about allergies and ingredients that are put forward. Um, one of the things that I heard mentioned, and I'm kind of speaking fast because of your time, um, is that there is a, a potential impact to Title I yeah. and the funding that schools receive. Um, I talked to our grants manager in the Burlington School District. We um, have not seen that change, and he said CEP has not impacted the amount of money that we have received. Um, the, C the provision two doesn't impact it because we still are collecting those applications, and every fourth year we would still collect those applications if that were to happen. So um, I just, I'm gonna leave it at that so that we can open up some time for questions. But what we have seen in Burlington is that it has been a financial um, benefit for the program. And um, anecdot anecdotally, what I hear from nurses and teachers and administrators is attendance is up, behavior is better, um, and students are, are much better fed. I had a lovely lunch at Integrated Arts. Here. There you go. I loved that school. Thank you, I'm glad you were there. Um, I just, uh, Ted, you have yeah, I'm happy to go at the end. At the end, okay. Two minutes, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, questions from the committee? Thoughts? Peter. Uh, so the, um, you know, one of the issues that has been brought up, and, and you touched on it a bit, is uh, if you have a universal meal program, getting the documentation you need um, for free and reduced lunch would go down because there's no longer the incentive to, to fill it out. And, you know, Waits River, I can see it's a small community. It's probably, you, you can personally go out and handle 12 people. But I was curious, with Burlington, would that be a, a bigger challenge, or do you foresee it being a it challenge? It hasn't been a challenge up until now. We still have to collect our household income forms. Right. It's part of the yearly registration process. It's all done online. Um, and we have, not me, but not our office, but um, the um, data team has gone out and really made sure that they have what they, they claim is 100%. Um, the... Um, one of the challenges Burlington has is our, our community of new Americans. Um, we have a team of liaisons that helps with translation um, and really goes after those folks to make sure that those applications are filled out. There are so many benefits beyond just school lunch for those applications to be sent in that, I mean, nobody's taking that lightly. We do need to have that information come forward and we've done, I think, a really decent job in collecting it. Yeah. Um, so, you know there's a very limited amount of, re you know, uh, revenues in terms of the education funding you know so we are have to make decisions about programs like what would be the best um, program for children to put the money towards the pro I totally support this program what I don't support is the funding because I don't think the two top fifths of Vermont in terms of income if you're earning 150 200 300 thousand dollars a year I don't think we need, I don't think we should be paying for those children's lunches. I think it should be a needs based, even if you, you know, and I think it's unfortunate if the formula is that we can't do that. Even if you wanted to raise it to wherever you thought in terms of children needing 
to lunch, but there are people that really don't need. Would you us. like them to respond to the, yes. the two fifths? The, yeah. it, or one fifth or whatever. I mean, I, I'm curious with Mark to hear the numbers. The I can say as an administrator, this is my 11th year at Waits River, so I had a number of, and my 33rd year in Vermont education in some capacity, and this has absolutely been um, a part of my career from day one, you know, talking about food and talking about free lunches and talking about socioeconomic division, um, especially having spent multiple years in special education. and. Um, I don't, I, I don't think of it as uh, there are people who can afford it and so they should pay. I think about it as a climate and a community of learning where we want everyone to come in and have um, the same opportunities, the same environment, the same culture, the, the same social interactions. When I think about breakfast and lunch, everybody's blending and having a conversation and, and going through the line and coming and sitting and such. There, there aren't those that there, there's no opportunity for someone to say, well, they must earn more money because they've got their bag lunch and they're in there already. And here, you know, is the line. It's exactly that historical picture of who's who and what is what. Uh, people who qualify for free and reduced lunches are not bringing bag lunches. Right. And so you immediately have a very obvious division. And you also have identifiable aspects. Right. But could you have, like, let's say a charge card, or people, let's say in the top two fifths, has this, have the same charge card, right? But a different coding, well, so and they their parents pay in, you right. know, to that, and they get it, it's like a debit, you know, it gets right. taken up. Much so, so, yeah, yeah I, we, we have that for okay. our paying students right now. Uh, I, I'll just on your two fifths. Um, I'm, I'm just throwing I, that just, out. That's fine. Yeah. I, I totally get that. So, in this room, if we had, you know, twenty people. Right, so um, you're gonna ask me to do the math in my head, but they're gonna be six or eight people that are um, that are in, in the category that you're speaking of, and the rest of our folks are potentially coming to that table with yeah. an empty belly. Yeah. The ability of 100% of the folks in this room to focus on the work or the the, the Madam Chair to keep everybody riled together um, as a teacher and, and a group of students, um, hungry children within a classroom impact everybody's ability to learn whether they're coming from I don't want from, children to be hungry. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we're assuming that um, families of means are going to send their child fed. And it is not the case in every in every situation. Um, I grew up in a family that did not require free reduced price meals, but my parents were off to work. It was left to me to feed myself and I was a teenage boy. I can tell you it didn't happen. You know, and that's happening in our schools all the time. And I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just yeah. saying that we are seeing that income doesn't necessarily <coughs> impact what we're seeing for hunger at our schools and the behavior within our classrooms. Ted, did you have something? The Agency of Education. Just very quickly, Ted Fisher, for the record, um, Vermont Agency of Education. Um, I, I just want to say really appreciate uh, this conversation. And um, uh, the agency is really, really supportive of any efforts to try to bring more access to student meals, free student meals um, across the state. Um, due to an error on my part, our director of child nutrition programs is not sitting next to me. So I apologize for that. Her name is Rosie Kruger, um, and I, the committee's interested in moving forward on this. I strongly suggest that you have her in to hear from that. Um, just very briefly, <clears throat> um, we have three concerns with the bill as drafted. Um, one is the issue of how the federal programs work for, um, for providing universal meals, uh, whether it's CEP or Provision 2. We're talking a lot with uh, our partners in other states, our, our colleagues in, in other state education agencies, about how they do it in their states. No other state does a statewide program. Some of them have uh, more limited universal pilot programs or various different things, and they are learning lessons, so we're trying to learn as much as we can from them. It concerns us that nobody else is is doing that, so we're trying to figure out what are the sort of problems of scale that exist. Um, the issue of data, which uh, folks already referenced, um, is there something that, that scaling statewide is something that's really concerning to us because we don't rely just on the data for the eligibility for the program. We rely on free and reduced lunch data as a proxy for all poverty metrics, so all of our federal um, funding is predicated on that data. Um, so we want to we want to make sure that as we move forward in this direction, that we have we get that ac accurate data. Um, 
and we also have concerns about the program cost, um, as sort of what Representative Austin was alluding to. Um, I know the JFO has an estimate of $40 million. When we did an estimate last year, we estimated $50 million for the total program cost. Um, I think our I think JFOs is a little bit more updated because we've been providing them some of our data for their estimate. I'm looking to mark to confirm. So theirs might be a little bit more up to date, but um, our concern is is that the bill requires putting uh, school boards to essentially put the fund this in their budget, and there's a sort of a, a weight that school boards will have to make. You know, they might choose not be able to choose to fund universal meals and make cuts elsewhere, you know, to the point about the waiting study and testimony that you folks have been hearing. Um, it sets up some difficult decisions at the local level that's something that folks should be aware of. So um, I'm not the expert on this, so you should hear from Rosie. We won't care. Just one thought. We also hear from Farm to School um, as another way, place to put our money. Response to that? I would say that Burlington's been a leader in the farm to school programming, and I think that both of those programs work um, together. Yeah. The universal meals bill would give schools the opportunity to invest substantially more money in our local economy, in our local farms, and in our local manufacturers and producers. Um, but I, I see these as um, companion bills more, um, and I feel that the farm to school and the universal meals would, would work well together. Um, and I think farm to school would benefit more if all of our students were able to get those meals at no charge. I appreciate you referring to your students as scholars. Okay. <laughs> okay.